Hi, I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. We both love and are fascinated by stories. Stories about people. Stories about places. And stories about events. Our stories give shape and form to life. They give texture, color, and rhythm to the blank canvas that every new day presents to us. And they do that by informing us of our past as a directional marker for our future. Okay, Will, it's narrative time. Tell me a story. So our first story here on the podcast, we wanted to talk a little bit about a person in both of our lives that we find very interesting. We have a pretty unique connection to this person. Um, His name is Dr. Christopher Armitage, um, and he's a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, a professor of English. Um, I've taken quite a few classes with him, and uh, my dad did as well, funny enough, kind of coincidentally. So um, it's probably apt that Christopher Armitage comes up in the intro podcast because I think he instilled a love of narrative and stories and writing to both Will and I. And my encounter with first encounter with Christopher Armitage was in about 1978 um, when he was teaching um, English literature. I took a year of English literature with Christopher and um, he taught me more about writing, how to read, write sparsely, powerfully, um, directly than anyone that I ever encountered. And, um, so one of the really impressive stories about Christopher Armitage to me was, um, it was a spring day in Chapel Hill. It was beautiful. And he decided we'd go outside on the campus and, uh, just sit under a tree. And, uh, we were studying actually love poetry. So he takes us out we all sit in sort of a circle and Christopher, um, had this big Roman nose, very distinguished looking person. And so he started reading this love poetry. And while he's reading it, tears started to stream down his face down by this big Roman nose. And and he just kept reading along. And after a while, he kind of wound it up and ended the class and sent us on our way. So as where we were walking across the campus, the quad there I was walking away with one of the girls in the class and I mentioned to her how powerful that poetry must be to bring Christopher Armitage to tears and she said well Christopher lost his wife during the fall so Christopher Armitage was kind of personality that would take that and a few months later turn it around into something really striking and emotional so that was my introduction to Chris. And after um, that encounter, then uh, I finished studying with him and finished my undergraduate degree. And he wrote me a recommendation to professional school, which must have been pretty good because I got in. That's, yeah, that's positive. So tell me a little about your story with Christopher Armitage. That's right. So I was a freshman English major. And I was trying to figure out something to to do for the summer. And I found a program where you got to go to London and Oxford with Dr. Armitage, which I actually recognized from um, my dad's experience with him, which I thought was pretty cool considering I was how many years removed from your experience? Oh, probably close to um, 25 or 30, something like that. 25. So, so quite a quite a long time. And uh, one of the most interesting things about the program was getting to go to St. Ed- Edmund Hall in Oxford, one of the constituent colleges of Oxford, where Dr. Armitage w- was educated as an undergraduate, being a resident there for about a month or so, you know, staying in the these ancient, I mean, ancient dorms, um, you know, and just being around kind of that center of an intellectual life with someone who had been there with, you know, Armitage was educated by Tolkien and um, C.S. Lewis, others, I'm sure. But those kind of stand out as, you know, kind of a direct line to those folks. That's that's a pretty cool. And we probably should mention what J.R.R. Tolkien wrote. The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and what were some of the things that C.S. Lewis wrote? He wrote... The Chronicles of Narnia are probably the most famous. 
And then he wrote about theology. Right. Pretty famous quish, Christian theologian. And spirituality. He just, he had such a wide ranging um, interest in things and wrote about them extensively. And so those were the kinds of people that Christopher ran with. Definitely. And uh, yeah, it was, so it was quite the experience to be able to go over there with him, spend time, you know, learn in that place. I mean, St. Edmund Hall, you know, I'll be honest, it's a bit of a rugby college at Oxford, you know, that's, but, um, despite that, I mean, it's got one of the oldest crypts, you know, some of the oldest parts of Oxford university are the, um, crypts under the chapel at St. Edmund Hall. So, you know, and we actually got to go into the crypts. Um, you know, we went with one of the security guards after we had a few beers at the college bar and, um, it was quite interesting to be down there because, you know, it's the, essentially the oldest place at the oldest Western university in the world. So the two things that are striking about that to me is that entry into the crypts into the very foundation of the place was a couple of beers. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and the second thing is like, uh, that goes back about a thousand years. Is that right? You know, uh, oh, you put me on the spot. I can look it up. And I guess what's even interesting about that is like the the country is about 250 years old. And if you went back to sort of where we were getting things rolling, you might go back to 1700. Right. And that's about 300 years ago. Okay. Oxford is about 922. And so it's pretty close to a thousand. So we'll say it's three times as old as when we started the United States. That's right. More than that. Okay. All right, so those are two pretty good stories about and some of the foundation of why we like stories so much. So tell me more about how, why stories are important to us. So I like to think about this in terms of narratives and cultural narratives are very important to me. Um, cultural narratives about the past, the present, and future, you know, I think that perhaps underrated in their power. Um, I think there's an interesting trade off almost between narratives and the actual truth of what has happened, right? So there's we've got this truth about the American Revolution and how just it was. And then there's this the narrative, you know, on the American side about how we were in the right, how, you know, this was like the absolute right thing to do. And if you actually look at it, at the end of the day, you might have questions about that narrative, that the American Revolution was the right thing. Um, now, it worked out pretty well. Absolutely. I, I think unequivocally that's true. But the narrative about the American Revolution, um, there are definitely questions there, right? I mean, so, you know, Britain, bla Br excuse me, Britain banned slavery much earlier than America did. And perhaps if we were still a British colony, that would have happened sooner. There's all these questions about that. But, um, this narrative of the American revolution as a just cause is, um, pervasive and very important to American identity. But at the end of the day, it's not perhaps what really happened. I think that goes, uh, sort of to the heart of, we create stories sort of this, historical marker so we can remember the past and it's just one person's perspective and perspective has such a huge impact on stories right so um and not and the great context the big context that's important um and we sort of rewrite these stories as we go along so the narrative changes over time absolutely it does it definitely does you know another very common narrative I find very interesting is the lost cause narrative, right? And, and I think a lot of the lost cause narrative is a, we can't understand as moderns, people who live in modernity that, you know, people actually did this. I mean, it was very, it's, it was very common up until, up until very recently to have slaves, slave labor, you know, you look at ancient Rome, this was commonly accepted. Um, and modernity is a, is a place where we uh, we kind of shun hierarchies. And I think America is one of the, you know, premier examples of, of sh you know, wanting to not believe that hierarchies exist in people. Um, 
And so, you know, lost cause narrative, another example of one of these things that is not really true. Um, it was actually a very horrible place for a lot of people, except for the people at the very top. And, um, people can't understand that because it is somewhat unfathomable today to, to realize how bad it really was. I think that there's a, it, it's just a really important part of history to recognize that up until this, when I say up until this point, maybe the last 200 years, um, whoever the victors were and, and, and the strife that was going on took the people that they conquered often and made slaves out of them. I was just reading about uh, the Comanches, which have a fascinating history. And they, they, that was just the way they, that was accepted part of their life is when they had um, uh, squabbles, inter-tribal squabbles, Whoever won the squabble, the uh, the set to, um, would take some of the people that they had um, had been having some kind of warfare with problems with, and they take them as slaves. Right. And there's and there's all kinds of examples. So it's really only in the last few hundred years, it appears, that we've really wrapped our minds around uh, this is decidedly wrong. Absolutely. I, you know, it, it's super interesting to me, especially so you mentioned the Comanche. So, um, if you go back and you look and you look at narratives around, um, Western people, European settlers, um, who for some reason got mixed up with, you know, native Americans in the, uh, frontier, most often they would always, um, end up sticking with them and find it much more enjoyable to live that way as a forager than as a modern farmer. If that makes sense. So we have this narrative that, you know, we have a very modern farmer mentality. Um, property rights are important because they have to be important to, to feed everyone. Right. Um, whereas as a forager, if you go out and you hunt Buffalo and then you kill Buffalo and you bring it back and then, you know, you feed everybody and there's plenty essentially for everyone, you know, you may live less time overall, but it's a healthier time, right? Because you have to be active. You have to, um, go out and work hard to find your food. Um, you're not sitting, you're not desk bound. You're not, you know, locked in a chair all day. Um, so, you know, we've gotten these absolute gains in longevity, a lot of it due to infant mortality. You know, it's this constant battle between, the mathematicians and the biologists, whether there's real longevity gains or if it's all just infant mortality, I think there's probably some real longevity gains. Um, but I think on average people live a lot worse than they did, um, when we were all foragers, but you can't really go back. Like Thomas Wolf said, you can't go home again to feed everyone. We're kind of stuck farming from now on. And part of the story could be that, you know, the things we're doing now, they're relatively new in history. So if we've got a lot of calories available to feed people, which we do, it could be that we're just learning to control the calories so that we get the right amount of calories and we get good calories and we make people healthy because we've just never done this before. It's true. So in a fairly, fairly short time, we've come a long ways and we have to adapt to that. We have to sort through it. We have to grow into what we've got. That's right. That's right. And so... And, and, you know, the, all this, there's a lot of civil unrest currently. And, um, you know, I can reach back 50 years ago and say, well, we've come a long ways and that's true. And, uh, and a lot of that has been formalizing how we're going to be, but still on a personal level, we still have a long ways to go. So I, I see it both ways. I think we've come a long ways in a fairly short period of time. I call 50 years, 75 years of history fairly short. Right. But we still got a long, long ways to go. And it has it has urgency to it because of how important these issues are. Definitely. And, you know, just recently, was it last week, I sent a tweet out. And it was this perfect image. It was on the left-hand side. We had the SpaceX launch. So we're finally back into space, right? And then on the right-hand side was the riots. They're burning a building. Um, and, you know, there's certain aesthetic because there's fire on both sides. But, 
I, I found it super interesting because a lot of people are finding the riots very disturbing. And, you know, on some, some level, yes, uh, it's scary because whenever there's violence or destruction of property, not a great thing. But I find it somewhat encouraging because there's something about, in my mind, there's a narrative that um, America stopped moving at Woodstock. You know, essentially, if you went into a house from the day Woodstock started, it would look very similar to the room we're sitting in today. The car is quite similar. I mean, you know, there's some differences, right? They're more fuel efficient, obviously. But um, there's some sense in which the only real areas where we progress, and this is something Peter Thiel talks about, um, is information technology. So our iPhones, you know, very insular facing changes and it's like we're finally getting back to the future again it's that you know people are you know they're mad about stuff it's we, we're finally moving ahead again and i think you know there's almost a trade-off between being stagnant and very calm and being dynamic and having a lot of chaos i think that's true and then what i what brings to mind is the book the fourth turning and although it seems like a long time since woodstock until until the present if you look at that window of history and say here's what we've gained or here's what we've done and um it's a lot it's probably the most that's ever been gained in history but that's the way that the present is is technology is exploding it's growing at a an enormous pace and uh but we're, we have a lot of expectations too and, and, and one of the things I think about the civil unrest is I think probably peaceful protest dominates the violence by some exponential factor, but that doesn't make the news so much. You That's know, true. somebody throws a brick through the window, there's a camera to record it. It's That's much more like, exciting. Yeah, it's much more exciting. So you hear a lot more about that. But if we could poll everybody in the country and say, what do you think? They, well, that would be a slam dunk, I think. I mean, it'd be overwhelmingly, we need to step forward. Right. You know, we need to listen better. We need to do better. But So you mentioned the fourth turning, and I think we'll, we'll talk about this in a later podcast. I find it quite interesting. Uh, the narrative around that book is that essentially history is not, you know, most historians would say history is a single point in time that keeps expanding, expanding you know, towards progress. It's kind of a Whig version of history. Um, whereas, you know, he views it more cyclically, which, you know, is not something most historians would find, you know, which is interesting, right? So when the experts go one way and, you know, there's a competing vision. Um, sometimes that's interesting, but we'll touch on that later. Okay, good. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. Join us next week for more narratives. <laughs>